Volume 1. The Valley of the Shadow. How would I ever feel safe again? It was finally over. 90% of the agony and physical suffering of the past 24 months was now behind me. My healing had finally manifested. But the grueling physical and mental trauma of the fight had left its scars. After months of experiencing what I can only describe as feeling totally abandoned by the magnificent God who I had known nearly my entire Christian life as my most beautiful, compassionate Heavenly Father. The Father of Lights. The Great Father of Mercies. The God of such kindness and compassion. I was now standing profoundly shaken, but still standing, on the very edge, about to step out of the searing, flaming wilderness. But I had literally been shaken to the core of my very being. Unless I was able to find the answers, it was very probable that I would never be able to feel completely safe again. I only had two options that lay before me. To live the rest of my life in a whirlwind of trauma and unanswered questions or to step from the searing wilderness into the throne room. A visit to my father's chamber. It was my birthday. It was actually my 53rd birthday. I was in Jerusalem, Israel, filming for TV. Now, two years later, my physical body was already in a restoration process and I wanted to spend my birthday with my Heavenly Father. We'd had a long day of filming in our TV studios and it must have been around 2 in the morning, the time when often I am with Daddy. Lately, my visits with Daddy had taken place in three distinct places. I would find myself in the throne room, in a vast meadow, or in what seemed to be one of the father's chambers, which seemed like an intimate library. Whenever I visit him in this chamber, I call it my father's chamber. I find myself sitting on his lap and I seem to be snuggling into his chest. In front of us is a huge desk, sometimes it appears to be an altar of some kind. Many times when I am there, there is a large open book on the table in front of us, which he explained to me is my personal book of life, and from which he often explains many things to me. I never see much further into the rest of the chamber. One particular visit, I had picked bunches of flowers for my beautiful Heavenly Father and one bunch of roses that I had given him instantly became embedded in the left-hand wall of this chamber, it was incredible, they were living, breathing flowers decorating his wall, like living floral wallpaper. Exquisite, beautiful. The second place where I have found myself often recently is the meadow. It is a vast, brightly green meadow filled with the most incredible array of flowers. To my far left, far off, is my earthly father's own garden. My earthly father is often painting using an easel. Sometimes he is playing the violin. To my far right is the heavenly father's own personal rose garden. Oh, how incredible! He walks in his heavenly garden like he used to walk with Adam and Eve and watches as I play in the meadow. But today, on my birthday, I found myself in my father's chamber. I had such an excitement in my spirit as I visited him this evening. Sometimes when I visit him there, I seem to be a small child of around 4 or 5, but today I felt I was around 19, it seemed, a princess coming of age. Daddy, Daddy. It's my birthday. I cuddled into him. I was excited, for I knew somehow that my daddy had a gift for me. I was right. There, on the table in front of us, was a large box, beautifully wrapped in the palest aquamarine, my favorite color in the entire world, and it had a beautiful, pale pink bow around it. Diamonds glistened from the center of the bow. Unwrap it. I could literally hear that gorgeous twinkle in his voice. I slid off his lap. Suddenly, I was standing on the far side of his chamber and walking towards him, walking through the thick, thick presence of his glory. Saturated in his presence. Hardly able to walk toward him because of the sheer weight of the glory that emanated from him. With one foot before the other, I walked towards his table. I carefully untied the pink bow and then removed the wrapping. I lifted the lid and gasped. Inside the box, in beautiful pale aqua tissue paper, lay the most exquisite tiara. It was silver, with diamonds, and pale aquamarine stones. I lifted it up with both hands and carefully slipped it on my head, but something hard seemed to be in the way. 
softly, I ran my fingers over small fragments of glass protruding from my head. I gasped in shock, looking back to my father. I had not noticed them before, yet, instantly I knew what the glass fragments were. They are trauma, daddy, aren't they? The father smiled gently and nodded. Up until now, beloved, they were so deeply embedded in your soul, that they were not externally visible. But now, your mind is healing from the long season of sickness and trauma and they are being exposed. I nodded. I knew that this was indeed the truth. I looked back down into the box and slowly lifted away the second layer of tissue paper. I gasped. There lay a pale blue dress in the exact shade of Robin's egg blue that I loved so much. I held it up and instantly I was wearing it. It was so utterly beautiful. Thank you, Daddy. Thank you, it's beautiful. Then I looked down and saw there was a huge seeping bloodstain over my heart. I looked up in horror at my Heavenly Father. It is the wound of abandonment, he said softly. When you were sick you experienced deep wounds of abandonment. You did not understand why such a thing could have happened to you. And so you felt unprotected. The father closed his eyes as though in great agony of soul. You thought I failed to protect you. I stood silent before him. For I knew it was all true. Although my spirit always knew otherwise, my heart had been so intensely assailed by the enemy, that indeed I felt during the worst most awful physical suffering that my Heavenly Father had abandoned me. But you understand more now. Yes, I whispered. My child, beloved child of my heart. I watched you. Crying for you. Yearning for you. Yet knowing that eventually you would return. In your most intense suffering, although you were not aware, I never left your side. The father picked up the most exquisitely cut glass canister filled to the brim with a liquid. These are your tears that you shed during your time of intense trial. He picked up another much, much larger canister. And, these are the tears that I shed. For you. And the father lifted the canister of his tears and poured them over the blood seeping from my heart. Instantly the blood stopped flowing and a great comfort washed over my heart. I will never abandon you. There is much, much more that I have yet to share with you, about the great sifting of the saints. But your heart is not yet ready. He smiled tenderly at me. There is another present. I looked into the box. There was more tissue paper. Slowly I lifted it up. Oh! This was the present of all presents. It was a pen. It looked like a fountain pen. I delicately picked it up and walked over and handed it to the father. I wanted him to keep it for me. Watch. The father picked it up, opened it and wrote. Immediately blood and fire flowed from the pen. This is your pen, beloved. When you write, you will write by the shed blood of my son and by the fire of my Holy Spirit. Without it, your words hold no power to change lives. With it, beloved child. A great impartation of my love, a great healing shall flow from the pages you write into the hearts and minds of those who read. He laid it tenderly on his table. I shall keep it for you here. Never write without coming here first and picking up the pen from me. I looked longingly at him. I will, Daddy. Daddy, you are so beautiful, I whispered. You are so beautiful, my beloved child. And once again, like a little child, I jumped on the father's lap and snuggled into his chest. Tell my children, the father's voice was filled with tenderness, tell my sons and daughters how I yearn for them, how I am for their fellowship. That I will never, never abandon them. I yawned. I was now tired. Of course, I will, daddy. And I fell asleep in my beautiful father's everlasting arms. End of chapter my story, shaken to the core let me start at the beginning. Beloved friend, if you are reading these words and have recently been or still find yourself in a place of intense testing and adversity, I believe that the Lord has asked me to share my story honestly, so that if you are facing severe adversity, momentary affliction, not only physical sickness but bereavement, loss or heartbreak, loss of a marriage, 
loss of your business, your home, of so many dreams, you can know that there is such real hope for you ahead. In April 2010, Rory and I had been stuck in New York during the Icelandic volcanic eruption on our way to Israel, and I had woken in the hotel with strange virus-like symptoms. We arrived in Israel a few days later and although we had just been through one of the hardest financial challenges in the ministry of our lives, I had been in one of the best places I had ever been spiritually. In fact, I remember spending time at the altar in our television studios in Jerusalem by myself feeling one of the strongest anointings of the Father that I had ever sensed. That same week, I had actually seen the glory cloud visibly manifesting as a thick white smoke filling the studio at the close of one of our TV programs. Yet, even though I had been steadfastly standing against the physical symptoms, worshipping, standing on the word for healing, and in union with my Heavenly Father, as yet, I had received no physical breakthrough. What I'm about to share is to impart a greater understanding of the incredible doors that were opening in our high call to impact the secular media mountain and the violent assignment that was released from the kingdom of darkness to stop us in our tracks. Rory and I had carried a vision in our hearts to produce a great Hollywood films that would cross over into the secular, for over 20 years. Our background, before we launched the UK and Europe's first Christian television network, God TV, had been in advertising and producing secular television commercials. We had received numerous prophetic words about our apostolic breakthrough into Hollywood. Before I even met or knew our friend Sean Bowles, he was literally stopped in his tracks by Jesus, while walking on the Hollywood Boulevard Walk of Fame. Jesus instructed him to go into a shop and buy me a tourist a key ring with cameras and a Hollywood sign and send them to me with a note that our film and book project Chronicles of Brothers would apostolically break through the gates of Hollywood. Our dear friends Kim Clement and Cindy Jacobs had seen the apostolic call to film over our lives for years and even the prophet Bob Jones continually saw two areas of major mandate over our lives, Israel and Hollywood. All that, to share that God TV is our first fruits but our heart has always burned with the Father's passion to affect multiple millions of this generation who would never set foot inside a church through the end-time book and movie series Chronicles of Brothers. About a month earlier, the producers of the DVD edition to Warner Brothers TV series Supernatural had contacted me to film an interview on the first book in the series, The Fall of Lucifer, The Father's Story, which I did, always excited about media evangelism. A few weeks later, my London book agent had contacted us with the news that Top X New Line film executive, who had been head of their European division for over 18 years in London, had just read the first book in my series Chronicles of Brothers, The Fall of Lucifer, had loved it and asked for a meeting. So, on our return to London after our television stint in Israel, we met this producer for breakfast at Claridge's. It was a wonderful meeting, and we left agreeing that Eileen Meisel, the producer, would read the next two books in the Chronicles of Brothers series, Messiah and Son of Perdition, and if she loved them as much as the first book, we'd have a second meeting. Things progressed rapidly from there and at the second meeting Eileen, exec producer of Golden Compass, said how much she completely loved the books. She was convinced that the world was desperate for this message and that the book series Chronicles of Brothers must be turned into an A-grade secular blockbuster film. She asked if she could send the books to her Los Angeles partner. We said, of course. It turned out that her business partner was none other than Mark Ordesky, executive producer of Lord of the Rings. Things progressed fast. Two months later, initial contracts between our secular production entertainment company, Warboys Entertainment, and Mark and Eileen were signed in Los Angeles. Just to add, we lived in Kansas at the time and God had given our dear friend Mike Bickle such a passion for Warboys and our vision to see the Chronicles developed into film. Eileen was genuinely passionate about the subject matter of Chronicles. She visited us at our home in Kansas for a week for a mega-story meeting for the Chronicles movie. It was so exciting. The vision Rory and I had held in our hearts for over 20 years, to influence a billion souls through secular film to apostolically take the entertainment mountain, had begun. The devil feared this media call. And he was enraged. How enraged, I was soon to discover. 
Eileen and I spent days tearing apart my fourth draft of the screenplay of Fall of Lucifer, preparing it for the big screen, and that Sunday night Mark Ordesky flew from L.A. to us in Kansas and we all had dinner at Jack Stack's in Kansas City. The vision for a grade media projects to evangelize the unchurched in excellence for the Lord was on its way. I was still not well, but continued to confess and stand on the word, trusting the Lord for complete healing. Mark Ordesky and I were already emailing back and forth different portfolios of prospective conceptual artists for the movie development process. Mark and Eileen had handpicked others to receive my draft of the screenplay. They all loved it. The next step for me was to edit it down on a semi-final rewrite to a $150 million budget. I started my edit on the screenplay, little knowing that my entire world was about to fall apart. One week later, precisely, I was hospitalized with the most intense nausea that not even the strongest anti-nausea drugs could stop. Nothing could stop the intense physical suffering. Tests, tests, more tests, then more tests, and more. In between, our dear friends, Mike and Diane Bickle at IHOP, compassionately prayed for me. For which I am forever grateful. More tests. In between I prayed with wonderful intercessors in Kansas, to cut off all generational ties, we prayed every prayer imaginable. Made sure I was walking in the light. In as much forgiveness as I knew how. Then the specialists said triumphantly, we've got the sucker. I was so happy. So relieved. Now I would be mended. If only I had known. The sucker was a rare condition known by the name gastroparesis. They believed mine was viral. That a virus had damaged the vagus nerve, which led to a slowed gut motility, which in turn caused intense nausea and almost total inability to eat. I had such high hopes. Now these horrific symptoms could be treated and I could go back to work in God TV, finish book 4 of the book series, Chronicles of Brothers, A Pale Horse, and continue with the movie development. Unfortunately gastroparesis was rare and the medical knowledge of how to treat it was still mostly in an experimental stage. The first drugs worked fairly well for me, but after three weeks I had to be taken off them because of the side effects. The second and third courses of drugs didn't work. And there were no more options. I was sick from morning till night. Our Christmas that year, I spent weeping while my poor family tried to enjoy Christmas dinner. Even though I was standing on the word, listening to Kenneth Hagen and every word teacher I could get my hands on, my symptoms grew worse. I couldn't eat. I dropped from a USA size 6 to a size 2. There was no respite. I fell asleep suffering. And I would wake shaking at 4.30 a.m. to another day of intense physical suffering. Finally, still in total faith that God had the answers, Rory and I flew to Philadelphia, to one of the very few gastroparesis clinics in the USA, believing I would find some key. Some answer. By the time I saw the specialist, I was hardly able to eat, suffering from the constant debilitating nausea and had already dropped nearly 25 pounds in weight. My heart was sinking from the questions he asked me. Everything was still in experimental stages. I had had such faith to be healed. I just didn't understand why I wasn't getting better. And why there was no medical treatment that could alleviate the severity of the symptoms. It appeared that there were only two treatments available that could possibly stop the extreme nausea and my inability to eat. The first new medical option was to Botox my stomach. The second option, which at that time was in the very experimental stages, was to implant a gastric pacemaker into my stomach. The specialist immediately booked my stomach for the Botox procedure the following week. Rory and I prayed about it and finally made a decision not to Botox my stomach. To cut a very long two-year story short, through a number of divine circumstances, I arrived at a Christian naturopathic retreat in Germany. I thought I would be there for three weeks. However, Rory, I, and our family were there for over six months. I so deeply appreciated Wayne and Irene, who ran the retreat. The amazing thing was that Karina, the wonderful nurse there, understood gastroparesis, her own husband had suffered with it. No words can ever express my gratitude for all they did for me in that testing time, 
but for all of us, it was no easy fix. For six months, I received infusions nearly every day. I was so used to tests and needles and blood draws, normally I'm pretty tough, but because it was purely naturopathic I had to put up with extremely severe symptoms for a drawn out period of time. As anyone in the midst of chronic sickness will understand, to be continually sick every day and never to know when it will end, or indeed if it would ever end, except by faith is, I believe, one of the very toughest things one can face in life. During that time the Daily Mail in the UK had a full-page article of a teenage girl who was diagnosed with exactly the same condition as myself and who had been on the verge of suicide because of the ongoing physical suffering. She was skin and bones. Specialists in London had just implanted her with one of the very first gastric pacemakers and she was able to eat again. She felt that her life had literally been saved. But it was all still experimental. I started to have anxiety attacks from the simple trauma of being constantly sick. For the next year what our TV viewers had absolutely no idea about is that Rory and I and our family lived out of two suitcases in clinic rooms or motel rooms in Germany, Florida, and Reading, California. My children, who were bewildered and somewhat angry, found themselves in limbo, as did Rory. Our dogs and cat were in kennels for an entire year. Our home in Kansas was left abandoned for an entire year. I couldn't function on a day-to-day -day basis. I couldn't look after my family. I couldn't manage my production and creative teams at God TV, let alone go on air. I couldn't even read a book, let alone write one. My ministry at God TV was over. My writing ministry was over. And the movie had obviously come to a grinding halt. I didn't only feel that I had lost my life. Practically, I had lost my entire life. Literally everything was not only on the altar, it was gone. I was completely trapped in this debilitating chronic sickness. Finally I reached the stage where I just couldn't face waking up to another day of physical suffering, another day of 24-hour nausea. I was trapped. I wanted it all to end. End of chapter. Abandonment The truth was that I felt totally abandoned by the God who had always been my all in all. I just would have rather been in heaven than had to cope with this unendurable physical suffering. Now I knew why Satan had said to God in Job, skin for skin. You see, there's a reason why Satan said, but touch him skin for skin. Beloved, if you are reading this and you are chronically ill, or you have a family member or friend whose physical body has been torn apart by suffering and they can't function normally or function at all, please understand that it also has a direct effect on their mind and soul. It is a very different issue to go through an operation where there is a distinct goal and you know that after the operation your body will most likely be mended. It may need time to heal, but you will be on the road to freedom. What I'm addressing here is the Father's absolute mercy and compassion for those who feel locked physically in an unending cycle of physical suffering where they can see absolutely no way out. There are only two eventualities. To be healed or to stay trapped in chronic illness. When Job was tested by the devil physically, the enemy's major strategy was to vex his spirit and to try to break his mind, to question God's faithfulness and his character. There were two things that exacerbated the trauma for me. One was that for the first nine months I took only the naturopathic route which did not alleviate the severity of any symptoms. Secondly, was the immense pressure of some of those directly around me whose continual message, both subliminal and spoken, was if you don't have enough faith, you won't be healed. You have to have faith. Beloved suffering child of the Father, for many people locked in this kind of severe physical suffering their faith is precisely the enemy's target made far worse by the fact that their human mind is reeling, Father, why have you forsaken me? Reeling in abandonment. To continually ask anyone who is going through the valley of the shadow where their faith is. To inform anyone going through severe abandonment that if they do not have faith, they'll stay sick forever, is today's form of a jobs comforter. For many who are chronically ill or facing the most intense trials, even the most correct word of faith theology, if it is mixed with a religious spirit, can easily become the letter of the law, with the potential to weaken faith, rather than promote faith, because our focus becomes set on our works. How much are we confessing the word? 
Is our faith too small? For many people, in situations facing severe physical sickness and severe adversity, their bodies and minds are already often stretched to their limit. They are fully aware that they are fighting fear. They are fully aware that their faith is on the line. So when a well-meaning comforter reminds them that what they fear will come upon them, instead of building up their faith, it has the potential to fling them into further despair. There is no one who knows the weaknesses of our own hearts better than ourselves. The men and women who held out the greatest lifeline to me, as I walked through the valley of the shadow, were those who surrounded me with love. Those who consistently held my hands up when I was in my darkest place. Who declared, we believe. We are standing for you. We will stand in the gap of your weakness until you are delivered. That is mercy indeed. To bear one another's burdens in this situation is truly the love of Christ. I know how hard it is to understand this until you have walked there. The enemy's greatest assignment in tribulations and testing, apart from the hindrance of your God-given call, is to severely malign the very character of the Father. Satan has lost his intimacy with our incredible Heavenly Father for eternity. Forever. He is vehemently jealous of you and me as blood-bought saints, that now we have access to the secret and deep places of the Father's own heart. And one of his greatest and most effective tools in this generation has been in both the secular world and in the church to defame and malign the Father's own character. He is the accuser of the brethren. And a great part of that, in the searing heat of a severe battle, outworks itself in his accusations to our souls, to accuse our omniscient Father in our minds and hearts. Satan tries to imprint his own character onto our Father's faultless, flawless one. God has abandoned you? Yet, Satan was the abandoner. God is not faithful to you? Yet, Satan is the eternally faithless one. God's promises do not come to pass? And yet Satan himself was called the father of lies by Jesus himself. There is no truth in him. And so day by day, the bombardments of the accuser, the maligner, accuse our faithful, unchanging, compassionate Holy Father, of unfaithfulness, of treachery, and of infidelity to us, his own children. But, O oh beloved, no matter the intensity of the furnace you may find yourself in, our beloved Heavenly Father is goodness, He is faithfulness, He is the unchanging one, He is kindness, He is compassion, He is benevolence, He is joy, He is peace, He is love, He is grace, oh, so full of grace. Beloved one, if you're reading this today and you're walking through the valley of the shadow and loss, and experiencing severe feelings of abandonment, oh, let this start to set you on the road to freedom. The Father is good. The Father is the kindest one. The Father is the compassionate one. And He reaches out His hand to you. And He would stroke your head and gently whisper to your heart, Beloved, you do have faith. I'm not asking you to have faith in healing. I'm asking you to have faith in me. I am goodness. I am faithfulness. There were entire days when all I could scream out in my head was like the blind man, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Do you realize that your cry of utter desperation to Jesus is faith? Faith, in the one who you knew, if he was physically with you in your room, he would touch you and you would immediately be made whole. When the body is tormented, you can reach a stage of such weakness. The Father sees the huge reserve of courage, fortitude, endurance, and perseverance just to survive another day but by the utter grace of God. Through this darkest valley, instead of rejecting God, instead of denying Him, I cried out to Him. I did have some jobs comforters around me, those who were full of formulas and the letter of the law. But I also had Liz and Marilyn, my amazing old and trusted friends. And God gave me some incredible new friends during this time. I will never, never forget how all these incredible friends and many more that we cannot mention here, prayed for me. They prayed for me, loved me and, most of all, never gave up praying. And never gave up hope. But the issue with a long and drawn out sickness is that eventually everyone has to return to their own lives, no matter how much they love you. I almost gave up hope. While I was at the retreat in Germany, 
the Lord sent Ed and Ruth Silvoso to the area and by a series of miraculous events they visited us. Ed and Ruth had both experienced life-threatening illness in their walks. They were so understanding and so compassionate. Ed shared that in his greatest hour of physical suffering, in agony of soul, that he cried out to God and asked him to tell him if this was a sickness unto death or if he would live. He was in such anguish of body and soul, but he said to the Lord that if the Lord said to him that he wanted Ed to live, that he would take all his reserves even in the dark, dark place, and fight. Ed also encouraged me to find medical, not just naturopathic help, at least to curb the intensity of the symptoms so that I could at least function in some capacity. We finally went to Bethel Church in Redding, California, through Chris Valaton's kindness, to meet my now beloved friend Julie Winter, a nurse practitioner who had helped Chris when he himself had been ill. By the time I reached Redding, I had dropped to just over 105 pounds, around 7 stones, still barely able to eat or function. And it was here at Bethel Church that I finally met Julie and her husband, Mike, who were so amazing and incredibly gracious, taking me into their home. It was under Julie's day-by-day -day compassionate care that I slowly continued to turn the corner. Julie operates in the wisdom and discernment of God, and she started to find some medical answers. I was still so sick that I was not in any way myself, but everyone at Bethel was so kind. Julie was on the board of Bethel Church, and Bill Johnson, who is just as wonderful as his books, would let me come in, sick and suffering, to the testimony meetings they have before the church services. The Bethel Healing Teams prayed for me so wonderfully many times. I would love to tell you that everything was healed in an instant. But the truth is that sometimes healing is a process, a somewhat lengthy process. It took another 18 months until I could finally eat normally and another year before I actually had months at a time free from nausea. But the greatest scar was the trauma. The trauma of why and how such a bad thing could have happened to me. And how would I ever, ever feel completely safe again? End of chapter The Meadow I had suddenly had an urgency to play and felt quite guilty about it. I had worked incessantly all my life having grown up with a mother whose work ethic was extremely serious. The net result was that subconsciously, I felt guilty if I played. Rory bought me a doll's house for my birthday, and I spent a good many hours dreaming about decorating it from Etsy, an online marketplace. And I had started using the creative social media site, Pinterest, and was pinning each night for literally hours. Daddy, I'm pinning and buying stuff for my doll's house. I should be talking and visiting you. Rest and play, the father said. Rest and play. Then, while away in Israel, during a God TV missions week, the father started taking me up in the spirit to a meadow. These encounters lasted each night from midnight onwards, for a period of many months. And with each encounter, I was gradually finding more freedom. I would find myself by the spirit in a vast meadow filled with beautiful spring flowers. Far to my left, I would see my wonderful earthly father in his heavenly garden. He would often be standing at an easel, painting. Then he would lift his head in ecstasy and cry, to the glory of God. Now, my dad, who was a doctor, had died when he was 92 and had been blind for the last few years of his life. And now here in heaven he was painting and was in his absolute element. And, oh, how he had loved his garden, and his garden here was just beautiful. To my right, also further off, was my heavenly father's rose garden. So, I was continually in the middle of both my heavenly and earthly father's gardens. I seemed to be around the age of four. I would be sitting on the ground in this amazing meadow of incredibly beautiful flowers, but directly around me was sand, so I was continually building sand castles. Night after night I would find myself in this same meadow, singing like a toddler, happily playing, building sand castle palaces, blissfully unaware of anything else in my world. Far, far below me was a huge battlefield where the great armies of the king warred. But every time I was in the meadow, I was doing nothing else but playing. Playing, dreaming, building sand castles, more playing. Somehow I knew that my heavenly father was watching me intently from his rose garden. 
Then, one day, in the first couple of weeks, I remember putting my hands to my head and feeling my blood seeping as huge, ugly, jagged pieces of glass fell out of my scalp, down onto the sand. The pieces of glass hurt my fingers. They were much, much larger than they had been a few months before on my birthday. There was already a large pile of jagged glass next to me. As more and more glass fell from my head, the more I played. And the angels swept it up and gathered it. Ministering angels, who seemed to wear mantles with red crosses, very quietly tended to my wounds. Although most of the glass was coming out of my head, there were now also shards coming from my heart and there were great bruises on my arms and legs. The angels, without a word, just continued quietly tending to the very raw wounds with vials of oil, tenderly, tenderly ministering to me. And I, almost oblivious to all this, just carried on playing. This continued for weeks, even several months. Each night, as I closed my eyes, I would find myself back in the same meadow. The more I played, the more glass fell from my head. I knew that it was trauma being evicted from my body. But I thought to be healed of the trauma I should be quoting the word incessantly. Not playing. Rest, rest and play. This happened night after night. Each night more jagged glass fell to the ground and the angels gently tended to my wounds. But always to my right was the father's own garden and the father himself would be walking, sometimes standing quietly, just watching me protectively as I played. Daddy. I looked up towards my heavenly father in his garden. Daddy, what is happening? Your wounds are the wounds of a great battle, beloved. The glass that falls from your head is trauma. The more you play, the more you rest as a little child in my presence, and the more healing of your body and your mind takes place on earth. Every time shards of jagged glass fall from your head it means that the trauma is falling from your mind. Beloved, many in my church do not yet understand how to heal those that have been wounded in battle. That is why it is so important that every wounded warrior runs directly to me. For in this present church age it is sometimes I, and I alone, who can bring the healing bomb that is essential to heal the wounds of this present age. But, Father, I hesitated. End of chapter. Hard questions and heavenly answers. Daddy. I sighed. There were still so many questions I had concerning the past year's trials. You may ask, the father said. But, Daddy, I thought I'm just supposed to let it go. I muttered feebly. If the truth be told, I had actually been going around and around and, thanks to my ever-inquiring brain and had nearly driven my friends and family to distraction wanting heavenly answers to why did this happen to me, so it was fitting that finally I actually asked my heavenly father. I almost felt him sigh, not in exasperation, but with the kind of amused sigh a mother gives a much beloved, stubborn, and very persistent child. Beloved child, I formed you in your mother's womb. I designed your very inward parts, how much more did I design your mind? I thought that I was just supposed to put the last season away, I mumbled, and not ask questions. Now I felt the father laughing. It's been almost impossible for you, hasn't it? Yes, daddy, it has, I said sheepishly. I so wished that I could have been like many around me who could just put things like this aside, but I just could not put it to rest. I hesitated. You mean you actually don't mind if I ask you? My child, it is true that there are things that need to be left and no questions asked, but, beloved child of my heart, there are times that only if the questions are asked and truly answered that you can find the rest that enables you to let the past season go. This is such a time. Now ask your questions. Okay, Daddy. There was a long silence. The father waited for me to continue. Daddy, please, I really need to know why, how that happened to me, I blurted. You mean why something so bad happened to you, why you were sick? Yes. And you have been bewildered and confused, because you were in intimate fellowship with me when it happened. Yes, Daddy, you know our verse. My favorite verse in the whole of the Old Testament was from Psalm 91. Because he has set his love upon me, 
therefore will I deliver him, I will set him on high, because he knows and understands my name, has a personal knowledge of my mercy, love and kindness, trusts and relies on me, knowing I will never forsake him, no, never. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him, I will be with him in trouble, I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Psalm 91 14 16, that felt like my life verse. And yet it felt as though my whole life had been ripped apart and I was going through the valley of the shadow. Daddy, as far as I know, I wasn't in unforgiveness, I was checking my heart, trying to walk in as much light as I could. I wasn't perfect of course. I grinned. I felt the father's humor. He well knew. And so you felt, my beloved child, that you were protected against serious attack. Yes, daddy, I really did. And when you entered into a season of outright warfare and intense physical suffering, you could not understand how this could have happened. And it felt as though I was not there. Daddy, I was so desperate. I had walked through many, many battles prior to this but none that was so intense when it came to physical suffering. It said you would protect me because I acknowledge your name. I will call upon you and you will answer me. You will deliver me and honor me. Beloved, my beautiful, beloved child, remember, I said that there were things you were not ready to hear. I am about to share some of those things with you. I waited. Because you greatly love me, like many others reading these words, and have been chosen before your conception, like all my sons and daughters, to have intimate fellowship with me, my enemies have become your enemies. Yes, Daddy, this I know and understand. Satan, cannot hurt me. But he is vehemently jealous of those who now intimately fellowship with me. He asked for permission to sift you, child. Even as he asked to sift Job and Peter and the disciples. Many of my children are at present going through a season of intense sifting. Let me tell you a story, a parable. I snuggled deeper into the father's lap and closed my eyes. This story is not just for you, beloved, it is for many of those who have suffered greatly in this past season. Who have entered the valley of the shadow of death. Oh, how much I love them and have yearned for them. Many of my children have believed that I have abandoned them. Listen to my words carefully, for they will deeply heal your heart. And heal theirs also. I felt the father stroke my hair. There was once a princess, a princess who grew up close to the king, her father. So close, that she was the apple of his eye, and he was her beloved father, her daddy, her protector. From the time she was just an infant, they fellowshiped together. They played and sang and danced and laughed together. How they loved each other. The great king had a fierce and unrelenting enemy. Before the princess was born, he had been second only to the king himself and had lived in the king's palace, in the throne room. But his pride and his jealousy caused him to be banished from the kingdom. And year by year, he turned crueler and more jealous of any that became the king's close companions. When the king created a new family, the king's enemy's wrath knew no bounds. But he was powerless against the great majesty and wisdom and goodness and power of the king and his kingdom. The king stood up and gave a mighty decree. That all who served him in spirit and in truth, and who set their love and allegiance only on him would always be protected and know the king's protection. This caused the king's enemy to rise up in a great fury. As the princess grew, the enemy set his sights on her in particular. For, oh how she loved the king. To be with him to serve him. Her whole life was solely intent on fulfilling his commands. But the king's enemy could not get near. Or even close to her. At every turn, she was protected by the king and his warriors. The princess grew into a young woman. She now ventured out beyond the palace and was always attended by the king's royal guard. The enemy launched many attacks against her on the highways and byways, but although there were some seemingly close calls, not one hair of her head was ever touched. And the enemy in great fury drew back to his macabre throne room in his fortress and schemed and schemed. Then finally he requested an audience with the king. 
the princess was greatly disturbed for her father, the great king was deeply sorrowed. She had never seen him so troubled. She ran up the aisle, and placed a garland of beautiful spring flowers upon his head and kissed him on both cheeks. Daddy, you are so beautiful. The great king looked upon her with such love, then took her in his arms. My child, how much do you love me? The princess stood back in shock. Why, daddy, you know how much I love you, with everything that is within me. The great king looked upon her, loving her. My child, there is coming a season of testing. Much testing. Know this, I will never, never abandon you. Of course you'll never abandon me, the princess cried gaily. You are my father. I am your beloved, the beloved of your heart. And the princess ran off to continue her royal duties. The great king put on his rubied crown and his mantle. He sat down on the throne and he lifted his scepter high. Let him enter, he cried. The enemy of the great king walked in triumph down the aisle of the throne room. What is it your request? I sue for your favor. You know you do not have my favor. I have come from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the great king said to his enemy, Consider my beloved princess. There is no one on earth like her, she is blameless and upright, she fears God and shuns evil. Does the princess fear and love you, great king, for nothing, the enemy replied. Have you not put a hedge around her and everything she has? You have blessed the work of her hands. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything she has, and she will surely curse you to your face. Wherever she goes, she is surrounded by your royal guard, or your warriors. Every step of her life, you have surrounded her and protected her. But take that protection away and you will soon see her allegiance depart from you. The Lord spoke to his enemy, Very well, then, everything she has is in your power, but on my daughter, the princess, he stood and then said fiercely. But on her do not lay a finger. Ha! You know I still have the legal right of access. I sue for the princess. I will remove the royal guard for a season. But you will see you are wrong. The king's enemy smiled maliciously. That is all I ask. The next time the princess rode through the woods, she was set upon by the king's enemies. They stole her chest of rubies and gold. But because she had been trained for years, she and her one faithful courier put up such a fight that the enemy's guards went running back in shame. The princess arrived home bruised and bloodied but victorious. She ran immediately to her father, the great king, who held her to his chest. And oh, how she loved him! The next day, the enemy of the great king returned. He strode up the aisle where the great king sat on his throne. The great king spoke quietly. Consider my beloved princess. There is no one on earth like her. She is blameless and upright. And she still maintains her integrity, though you incited me against her to ruin her without any reason. Skin for her skin. Satan replied. A man, a woman, will give all he has for his own life. But now stretch out your hand and strike her flesh and bones, and she will surely curse you to your face. The great king was silent for many minutes. Then he raised his head to his enemy, tears were streaming down his face. Very well, then, his voice was barely audible. She, my beautiful daughter, is in your hands. The great king was moved with sorrow, he rose and departed from the throne room, turning once more. Fierce. But, you must spare her life. End of chapter. The Great Sifting the wearing down of the saints. There was a long silence. I raised my face from the father's chest. Daddy, you're talking about Job. Yes, said the father. I'm talking about Job. And I'm talking about you and all who in this past season of intense testing on earth have found themselves walking through the valley of the shadow. There are many at this moment who are facing trials that are direct warfare and easily discerned. There are others who are experiencing attack, through unhealed wounds and through areas of vulnerability, where the enemy has found access. But there is yet a third group in this hour. 
those of my children, who have been sifted, not by my hand, but by the enemy's hand. I snuggled further into my father's chest. I sensed a glimmer of a smile on the father's face. You may as well say it, he said. I lifted my head, still as a four-year-old. But I don't believe in sifting, father. I declared. There was a very long silence. The truth was that I also didn't want to write about sifting, as I was well aware of the controversy it would cause. I mean, I grew up in the strongest time of the Word of Faith movement. I was extremely thankful that the Father has such an amazing and forbearing sense of humor. He totally ignored my theological standpoint and continued. Many have been sued for by Satan in this past season on earth. Many of my dread champions, both known and unknown. Apostles. Prophets. Seers. Intercessors. Those called apostolically to take dominion of the mountains of kingdom government. All those that Satan and his principalities and powers recognized my mantle upon, the reason for the season of violent assault upon my church. Satan himself is terrified. He fears these ones and the next great move of my spirit greatly. He fears these, my servants, because heaven is about to invade earth. Because there is about to come the greatest move of my spirit released upon the earth that has ever been known. So Satan sued for many of those who are called to take up position in this outpouring. To launch such cruel attacks that their faith and trust will be totally shaken. Like a heat-seeking missile. Yes. The heat, the very fire of my call, my favor. My mark upon my sons and daughters in this season caught the enemy's full attention. Because of their call to dominion, their books were called up by the accuser of the brethren into the highest courts of heaven, the high courts of justice. Thousands upon thousands of books from all across the earth were brought by the accuser before the chief justices of the councils of heaven. Because of these one's callings to affect entire nations and to bring kingdom government and dominion to apostolic areas of rule in the earth, these warriors have been anointed by my Holy Spirit to apostolically walk through the very gates of hell in the areas of kingdom government. To wrest the kingdom of darkness with violence and take it by force. The Father was answering the question that had been burning in my soul for months. In this past season, I had watched many of those that I knew to be totally sold out to the Lord walking in the authority of the believer, who were strong in the word and intimate with the Father be hit by such extreme and violent assaults on their families, ministries, and bodies. Some had lost sons, daughters, even babies. Others had lost husbands and wives. Many had been hit with cruel attacks against their bodies. Still others had experienced tremendous financial hardship. The unspoken question of my heart had been, how? when we were walking as closely with the Lord as we could, when our greatest desire was to serve Him and to see His kingdom come. Yet, I and so many others had felt almost unprotected from the onslaught of the enemy in this past season. There was a long silence. It is the unspoken question of many of my dread champions who have found themselves in the severest tests of their lives in this past season. I waited. Silent. Eons ago. Satan himself was sifted. When he was sifted in these same high courts of justice, his heart fell to pride. He failed the sifting process. Now his demand in this past season, is as it was with Job, that my champions, those who professed to love me more than their own lives, who had moved in greatest intimacy with me. Those who had been given the mantle to demolish the kingdoms of darkness are sifted even as Job and Peter, and Satan himself. But Father! I hesitated. That's not what I was taught. The Father waited patiently for me to continue I had studied at Rima College in the strongest time of the Word of Faith movement. I was taught that the reason Job suffered was because what Job feared came upon him. But that is not what I said. The Father's voice became sterner. My sons and daughters need to discern correctly the weights and balances placed upon certain aspects of my Word. They need to rightly divide my word of truth. The words of Job were not my words. They were not even the words that my servant Job would have declared in his normal everyday life. These words were the desperate cry of a faithful servant of mine who was undergoing the most intense physical and mental anguish of sifting, 
pushed to the limit of his endurance. Not words on which to base an entire theology. Now study closely my words in this situation in Job 1 verse 8, And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who reverently fears God and abstains from and shuns evil because it is wrong? Nowhere did I say that Job was in fear or that he had opened his own soul up to be sifted. In fact, I said very clearly that there was none like my servant Job on earth, that he was a blameless and upright man who reverently feared me and shunned evil. Now there was a day when the sons, the angels, of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan, the adversary and accuser, also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where did you come? Then Satan answered the Lord, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who reverently fears God and abstains from and shuns evil because it is wrong? Then Satan answered the Lord, Does Job reverently fear God for nothing? But put forth your hand now and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, the adversary and the accuser, Behold, all that he has is in your power, only upon the man himself put not forth your hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Job 1 colon 6 9, 11 12, in the first chapter of Job, it was Satan who challenged me and said that I had protected Job with my hedge of protection. Have you not put a hedge about him and his house and all that he has, on every side? You have conferred prosperity and happiness upon him in the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. Job 1.10, it was Satan who said, Take away your hand of protection and then see how Job will curse me to my face. And the Lord said to Satan, the adversary and the accuser, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Job 1.12, Remember, Job passed the first assault of the enemy. Satan knowing full well that he had failed, then tried his most cruel assault. He well knew that intense and unending physical suffering of a man or woman's physical body has the capacity to break a man or woman's mind and to vex their soul to the breaking point. Then Satan answered the Lord, skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has will he give for his life. But put forth your hand now, and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse and renounce you to your face. Job 2 colon 4 5, not in one place in this conversation between myself and the devil do you find anywhere where the reason for this sifting can be laid at Job's door. In fact, it was only when I removed the hedge of protection from my servant Job that the enemy was allowed to move in upon his possessions, his family, and finally to attack his physical body. Rightly divide the word of truth, my child. I sighed. I still had more questions and the father well knew it. I am answering your questions about the devil's ability to sift my saints today not only for you, beloved, but for many, many of my children who have been experiencing sifting in this present season, who have been bewildered because my church has not rightly discerned my word in this matter. Knowing what I say will set them free. Ask your next question. I hesitated. Father, Job was sifted. And Peter was sifted but surely after Jesus died on the cross and overcame Satan and the principalities and powers, surely Satan no longer has access to heaven to accuse the saints. This is an important question, my child, and one that is essential for my sons and daughters to understand in these end times. Satan's first banishment occurred before Job. Yet he still had access to the courts of heaven. The major difference between Job and my children today is the atonement. The issue is that my children may still be assaulted and violently sifted, but they now hold a major weapon against the devil in their arsenal, the atonement. But even after the cross, the devil still has access to accuse the saints until he is thrown down to earth by Michael during the tribulation. In Revelation what do I say? Then war broke out in heaven, Michael and his angels went forth to battle with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they were defeated and there was no room found for them in heaven any longer. And the huge dragon was cast down and out, that age-old serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, he who is the seducer, deceiver, 
of all humanity the world over, he was forced out and down to the earth, and his angels were flung out along with him. Revelation 12 79, now read the next verses. Then I heard a strong, loud, voice in heaven, saying, Now it has come, the salvation and the power and the kingdom, the dominion, the reign, of our God, and the power, the sovereignty, the authority, of his Christ, the Messiah, for the accuser of our brethren, he who keeps bringing before our God charges against them day and night, has been cast out. And they have overcome, conquered, him by means of the blood of the Lamb and by the utterance of their testimony, for they did not love and cling to life even when faced with death holding their lives cheap till they had to die for their witnessing. Therefore be glad, exult, O heavens and you that dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in fierce anger, fury, because he knows that he has only a short time left. Revelation 12 10 12, this takes place only during the tribulation, child. As severe as things are presently on the earth, Satan has not yet come to dwell on the earth in fierce anger. This will not occur till the tribulation. In verse 10, it is the accuser of the brethren who is bringing charges against my children day and night. Until the time of the end, beloved, until that day when Satan will be flung down to earth by Michael, he still has access to accuse my children, and brings charges against them day and night. Always read in context, child. Now, remember my servant Paul and his thorn in the flesh. Yes, father. What has this to do with sifting? Go back to my word. The thorn in the flesh that was, allowed, allowed because of the exceeding revelations he had received. Oh, no. I took a deep breath. Now, we were touching on even more controversial theology. That also would not be accepted by some charismatic or word of faith theologians of today. I could sense the father smiling. I'm not scared of your theology, beloved. Paul's thorn in the flesh was a messenger of Satan. I had read in a book written over 100 years ago of a saint who had been to heaven. The Lord had revealed to him that Paul's thorn was an actual man who rose up in great opposition to him. Yes, Father. My son, Jesus, had already died on the cross when Paul was preaching. Is this true? I nodded. So the authority of the believer and the atonement were already in place. Yes, Father, I answered hesitantly. I knew exactly where the Father was headed. Yet today in much of the church, sifting by the enemy is discounted because of the cross. Paul's thorn, I whispered. But Father, certain ministers answer that by saying that he should have rebuked it, not to have asked you to rebuke it for him. I almost felt embarrassed repeating what was being taught in some circles of the church. My servant Paul had one of the most profound revelations of the believers seated in heavenly places. My servant Paul was the very one who wrote about the authority of the believer. Do you not think, that if it had only been necessary to rebuke it, he would have done it? And what did I say? You said, your grace was sufficient. Correct. Beloved child, what no one knows is that actually Paul's opponent was not there forever. But because of his great revelation he was sifted by the enemy. That is why my grace had to be sufficient for him for a season. This was, after, the cross. If anyone had the knowledge and the power to rebuke the enemy in the revelation of the authority of the believer, it was Paul. And to keep me from being puffed up and too much elated by the exceeding greatness, preeminence, of these revelations, there was given me a thorn, a splinter, in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to rack and buffet and harass me, to keep me from being excessively exalted. Three times I called upon the Lord and besought him about this and begged that it might depart from me, but he said to me, My grace, my favor and loving kindness and mercy, is enough for you sufficient against any danger and enables you to bear the trouble manfully, for my strength and power are made perfect, fulfilled and completed, and show themselves most effective in your weakness. Therefore, I will all the more gladly glory in my weaknesses and infirmities, that the strength and power of Christ, the Messiah, may rest, yes, may pitch a tent over and dwell, upon me. 
2 Corinthians 12 7 9, Finally, remember Pastor Roland Buck. My mind raced back to the late 70s when I had first been born again. Pastor Roland Buck had been an elderly, well-respected pastor in Idaho who had received many visitations from angels and had been taken up physically to the Father's throne room, where the Father himself had given him a piece of paper listing several hundred separate events and people that he would meet. Every single event on that piece of paper happened exactly as the Lord had said. Even to the choosing of the Pope. This was our Sovereign God. Look to my word, beloved. Many of my teachers here on earth have been given a portion of my revelation. And it is tempting to look only at that portion. But know this, that the authority of the believer and my sovereignty over all those whose lives are fully committed to me are both the spiritual truths of my kingdom. They may appear to contradict each other. But they do not. They are equally important. And they need to be rightly divided and rightly balanced. Remember that true wisdom is not found in man's opinion, even the most spiritual man. It is found only in my word. It is found only in me. Now rest your mind, beloved. Come, it is time for me to show you the mantles my tested ones have earned as overcomers, through the sifting of their spirits, souls, and flesh. You should be exceedingly glad on this account, though now for a little while you may be distressed by trials and suffer temptations so that the genuineness of your faith may be tested, your faith which is infinitely more precious than the perishable gold which is tested and purified by fire. This proving of your faith is intended to redound to your praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, is revealed. Without having seen Him, you love Him, though you do not even now see Him, you believe in Him and exult and thrill with inexpressible and glorious, triumphant, heavenly, joy. At the same time you receive the result, outcome, consummation, of your faith, the salvation of your souls. 1 Peter 1 6 9, End of Chapter The mantles I raised my head and suddenly we were in what seemed to be a type of beautifully designed storehouse. As far as my eyes could see, thousands upon thousands of mantles seemed to literally hover above the floor. Some seemed to be fashioned of royal blue velvet. Others of emerald and I saw others of crimson velvet. All with ermine fur at their collars. Next to each mantle of this type hovered an enormous golden scepter with emeralds, rubies, or sapphires embedded in the orb. Then I turned and saw other mantles. These seemed to be made of the most incredible gossamer type fabric, literally shimmering with rainbow hues. And next to each of these hovered intricately designed, silver scepters that seemed to radiate some form of blue electrical charges like lightning. Above each of these mantles was a delicate tiara, with one beautiful sapphire and aquamarine diamond in the very center. Somehow, I knew that the velvet and ermine robes were governmental mantles for the apostles to the nations and apostles to the mountains. The gossamer mantles were supernatural mantles of the Father's glory for the prophets and the seers and the watchmen. I was about to move towards one that especially drew me, when I felt the Lord Jesus touch my shoulder. Beloved, before my children can put on their mantles, they must be healed of the trauma experienced from passing through long seasons of physical infirmity and the suffering they went through. He looked at me with such intense love. Intense mercy. Intense compassion. You are greatly healed, but the long season of despair and abandonment has left you vulnerable. Tenderly, he reached out his fingers and touched the fading scar that still encircled my head. In this next season, it is important that my dread champions who receive my mantles for the end times battle that dawns. That any places that are still vulnerable to the enemy are sealed off by my Holy Spirit. The places of abandonment, the place of safety. My heart sank. For as hard as I tried, there was still in the deepest recess of my heart, a deep well of hidden fear that caused me to feel that I could never be completely safe again. That because my entire world, my very life, had been so ravaged while my love was set upon the Father. How would I ever feel completely safe again? It was almost as though I was living my entire life on guard. That deep in my heart, no matter how my brain reasoned against it, my soul was still screaming, life is not safe even if you set your love upon him. Sometimes it was a memory. 
sometimes a triggered an intense fear. I sensed the father very near. Father, I have tried with all my strength, but my heart is still unable to rest in complete safety. Instead of any condemnation, instead of any reproach, I felt again such an intense love and compassion coming from the father. It is not your job to try to once again feel safe, child. Relinquish your mind and heart to me. Remember my servant job. I nodded. It was my hand of restitution. My hand of restoration. It was my right hand of justice that healed the final vulnerable places and scars from his mind and heart. Your final healing of trauma will not be dependent on your works, child. It is now dependent on my grace. It is dependent on my goodness. I knew the father was smiling. Your only part in your healing, in this your final deliverance, is to rest in me. For my goodness and my mercy shall surely find you. And shall follow you all the days of your life. And as it shall be with you, so it shall be with many others of my children. The father picked up an exquisite gossamer mantle that reflected light like a rainbow and held it over my head. I started to panic. I am not ready, father. You yourself have said, I am not fully healed. The father gently placed the mantle over my head until it rested around my neck. I felt the gossamer cloak billowing behind me. The enormous weight of the mantle's glory was overwhelming. I could barely stand. Then the father placed the silver glowing tiara upon my head. More heavy, heavy glory. All at once it was as though my head was being anointed with oil. There was a life verse on every mantle unique to the person it was created for. Then slowly the father handed me the scepter. And the power of the supernatural authority surged like electricity through my fingers, right to my heart. And yet, my heart still felt that awful unspoken dread of being unsafe. You still feel the effects of trauma. I nodded. Even though you wear the mantle? Remember what I told you. This mantle is my great grace upon you. In not so many days, a new door opens before you and before many like you. A door of restitution, of restoration, of justice. I did not require you to be fully healed before you received your mantle. I only required you to understand that there are still vulnerable places that still need to be healed. In your weakness, even as my servant Paul, lies your strength. You see, my child. What is courage? He asked me tenderly. Courage, father, is when you're brave, and you don't fear. No, the father smiled again with great tenderness. Courage, my beloved daughter is not always the absence of fear. It is doing something even though you are afraid. That is what overcoming means. The greatest overcomers are those who overcome the most fear, the most traumas. Courage is often measured here in heaven far differently than on the earth. The times of greatest courage are often the times when my children are hit by terror and fear, and yet still they stand. Still they endure. Still they persevere. Remember, this one thing will remain. What is that, Daddy? That all these ones hewn in the furnace of Satan's attacks and in the intense warfare of these end days. That these ones are mine. They are mine. They will have open access to my throne. They will sit on my lap and rest in my everlasting arms. They will whisper their deepest and innermost thoughts to me. And I will whisper back to them. And they will hear my voice even as the voice of a mother as the voice of a father. Even while they fulfill their destiny on earth. These are the ones who will live often at my throne. Now, go, beloved. Instantly I was surrounded by the heavenly host. You have been out of the battle too long. The father raised his hand. And instantly I found myself in the throne room.